Well, thank you very much indeed, Jordan. Well, gentlemen and lady, thank you very much for having me. I am so excited to be here. This is totally the most exciting, forward-looking and lucky country in the world. It, and it really is, and I, but believe me, I don't, this is not like I, this is not something I say to all the girls, right? It's not, I'm not like I'm not, I'm not going to say this in California when I get there tomorrow. I, I just want you to consider what is going on here that makes it so incredibly different from everywhere else. So I was uh, at the office of the New Zealand Initiative this afternoon, and they were all moaning as think tanks are supposed to do, right? So the, the role of a think tank is to grumble about the government, uh, and yes, okay, the, it's an improvement, but we haven't got this and that. And there was a, there was a great moment when young Eric over there said, "Look, the budget uh, uh, in 2019 had a figure of 28 percent of GDP being ta taken by the state, and actually now it's above 30 percent, and it's going to get even higher." Do you know what proportion of GDP is state spending in the UK? 49%, right? The world would swap its problems for your problems. I say this every time I come here, right? On almost every level, this is an incredibly happy, lucky, and blessed country. Um, and particularly today, I mean, I'm really excited to see all the, all the coalition partners around this table. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm awestruck by the fact that you are able to win and then govern on the basis of cutting spending, cutting debt, restoring order and, and sanity to the financial system. I mean, everywhere else in the world, the impact of the lockdown, the impact of paying people to stay home for the better part of two years, has been to habituate them to handouts. It's very easy to spin the taps open. It's very hard to screw them shut again. And there are very few places where people would vote for a program like that, and where politicians would then be in a position to implement it, right? So we have our 49% of GDP after 14 years of Tory government, right? <laughs> you have yours uh, just coming out of six years of Labour government. So tell me that this is not a, a lucky country. Um, that, of course, doesn't happen on its own. I'm sure the politicians here will recognize the important contribution that comes from the, the wider movement, right? The penumbra, the halo around the right of centre parties, uh, not least organisations like our hosts, the Taxpayers' Union. The biggest in the world, proportionately. 200,000 members. How about that, right? Bigger than everywhere except on some measures North Korea, uh, sorry, North Korea, South Korea. <laughs> South Korea, I'm sure they've got a huge one in North Korea, compulsory one. You're all taxpayers and you're all united, and they, I'm sure they love the word union in North Korea. But South Korea, I think, has a slightly big one, but in South Korea, they actually give you tax avoidance advice, which isn't really a like with like comparison uh, with this one. And Jordan, I don't know if you all know this, as well as, as having presided over this huge growth of the taxpayers' union here, is the head of all the Federation of Global Taxpayers Associates. He is the, he is the capo di tutti capi of the global taxpayer uh, movement. And so he has done the most incredible job. Imagine having... I mean, I think Jordan told me that the, the Taxpayers' Union was inspired by the Taxpayers' Alliance in the UK. It is now bigger, not in proportionate terms, it is bigger in absolute terms than the Taxpayers Alliance in the UK, right? A country of 70 million people. So what can I say but in the words of the old spiritual, roll, Jordan, roll. Hallelujah, <laughs> roll, Jordan, roll. OK, guys, I, I would like to... I'd like you to, to, to take us back briefly to the sweltering summer of 1647. End of the English Civil War that I was just discussing with Shane and with Tim uh, Grosser, right? So. The, uh, the, the Civil War has just ended. The, the, the Roundhead Army is advancing on London, angry and unpaid. And the parliamentary authorities, in a conciliatory gesture, take the parliamentary uh, commander, Sir Thomas Fairfax, and they say, you be constable of the Tower of London. So Fairfax arrives to take up his post, and his first act is an incredibly encouraging one. He calls for the greatest treasure in the Tower to be brought to him. Not uh, a crown or a chest of coins, but an old parchment with spidery Latin script, Magna Carta. And as it's brought to him, he breathes reverently, this is that we have fought for, and with God's help, we will maintain. Right? It was the most extraordinary power this 
document that emerged almost accidentally, right? A, uh, a peace treaty between a cornered king and his mutinous nobles that then created not only the concept of the rule of law, the concept of the law of the land, but the idea of equality before it, that laws were equal and certain and general. We're 800 years on. I think it's almost impossible at this distance in time to see how radical those things were when they were first proposed, right? We've had 800 years of the rule of law, so we're really used to it. How, how extraordinary, the first time that somebody stood up and said, the law is no longer the word of the king or the biggest guy in the tribe. Above the king, there is something that we can't see or hear or touch, but it binds the king as surely as it binds his poorest subject, and that something is the law. And from that document, with its internal correction mechanism, came the Bill of Rights, came in the end parliamentary democracy, came all of the things that we regard as making the modern world comfortable and modern and rational. The seeds were all there. Habeas corpus, uncensored newspapers, equality between men and women, jury trials, all of those things come from that tradition and were largely adumbrated in the language in which you're now listening to my words. We talk about them as universal rights, right? But just imagine, if, if we, English-speaking democracies, had not stood together and enforced them with force of arms against author authoritarian and autocratic challenges, would we still call them universal? Imagine that the Second World War had ended differently. Imagine that the Cold War had ended differently. There'd be nothing universal about them then. Now, you've all worked out why I'm talking about treaties, right? Uh, here we are in the middle of forming this government. I, I, I think Magna Carta is a foundational document for all of the Anglosphere democracies. I think it's our, our shared heritage, kind of regardless of where our grandparents were born, right? But once, once you are in these countries, this becomes part of your patrimony. But of course, New Zealand has a second founding treaty and it, too, arguably was uh, a, a, an almost accidental treaty uh, 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 that came out of a, a specific historical moment. And yet, think of how extraordinary it was at the time. You know, 1840 is a unipolar world in a way that we have never known. It was, it was that unbalanced. Here you have the, the supreme power coming across a place that has been so isolated that no one's really needed to have a concept of sovereignty before because sovereignty means somebody else. And the treaty provides, not perfectly, but extraordinarily for its time, for equality, for people to be treated the same way, and for justice, end of slavery and so on. Now, was it ideal? No, look, nothing in this life is perfect. Uh, was it breached? Yeah, without question. I don't think any, anyone around this table is going to deny that. But exactly like Magna Carta, it had a correction mechanism that provided a way for wrongs to be righted or at least for grievances uh, to be redressed. I, uh, the last time I was here, uh, I was with my family on holiday, uh, on holiday and I went to, to Waitangi. And I took my family, they, they have this fantastic thing where you go for a, for a hangi. And the guides said, um, now we were a kind of group of tourists, they said, now one of you is going to be sort of challenged and you've got to respond with a speech. And being a tourist, everyone was supposed to go, no, no, no. So they said, how about you, sir? I said, yeah, I think I can manage that. My children were going, no, 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 not him. No, 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 anyone but him. So we, we went around and we, were, you know, did, we had the challenge and so on. And then they said, right, now is your moment to speak. Well, I've been thinking about it for a bit. So I, I gave them 25 minutes <laughs> on, on, the, on, the, on, the Maori, on the Maori contribution to the two wars. And if I say so, guys, I was on really good form that day. <laughs> I, I, I was, I, by the time I got onto the contributions of the, the 28th Maori Battalion in Tunisia, I was almost in tears, and the guides were in tears. I never knew that, mate. That was amazing. <laughs> but the reason I tell you that is because it was, a, 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 for, for all of that period, it was still seen as an extraordinary thing that we'd come together, whatever the heritage of people in these islands, that they'd come together uh, in the name of ideals that elevated, as Magna Carta, the rules above the rulers 
and that elevated the individual above the collective. And the, the Maori, just like the non-Maori contributions to the two war efforts, I think had this sense at the back of their minds that people who were prepared to cross the world uh, and take up somebody else's fight, that they were defending a system that was better than the alternative. I came across a really moving uh, speech by a Maori elder in 1918 when he's talking about why he was encouraging people to join up. And I'm going to quote it in full. I committed it to memory. He said, we know of the Samoans are kin. We know of the natives of German East Africa and German West Africa. And we know of the extermination of the Hereros. And that is enough for us. For 78 years, we have been not under the British, but governing ourselves. And we understand that British sovereignty is based on the eternal principles of justice and liberty. I think that was a pretty fair assessment of the difference between the two sides. It was certainly a pretty fair assessment of the difference between the two sides a generation later. And you know, New Zealand has a pretty good record of having been on the right side every time democracies and autocracies have contended. And I think the founding charter of New Zealand played its part in shaping those values. And for a long time, it was seen as an uncomplicated uh, benefit and, and boon, that it was a, a blessing to have been here, until an eye blink ago. Right? So what's changed? Well, you, know, you guys know the, the history of this country obviously much better than I do, but I've been struck by one particular thing that has happened very recently, and it's the way in which all the Anglosphere countries, all of the English-speaking democracies, prone as we are to shared cultural currents, have been impacted by the racial problems that they have in the US, to the point where we have started to see all ethnic questions through the prism of Selma and segregation as if it were our story. So if I talk for a moment about my, my own country, believe me when I tell you that in any primary school in the United Kingdom, Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks will be much better known to any child than John Locke or John Milton. You know, they have classrooms named after them, they have films about them. Okay, great, very impressive people and everything, but not really our story. And yet we've got to the point where we have imported not just the, the iconography, but the language. So people talk about things like all white juries in the UK. Well, come on, if you're in the middle of rural Wales, what the hell else is it gonna be, right? I mean, it's like, you know, um, we, we, we use these imported terms. If you are a white conservative, they call you a Klansman. If you're a black conservative, they call you an Uncle Tom. Apart from being unbelievably insulting, what's it got to do with us? Right? And this bizarre importation reached its climax for me in the summer of 2020, when we repeatedly watched white British BLM supporters shouting in their cosplaying way, hands up, don't shoot, at unarmed <laughs> metropolitan policemen, right? <laughs> we have completely come to see this as if we were now, in a way, I think it's really funny. But on, a, on another level, it's really not funny. If you were a, suppose you were a small black British child, just kind of getting the news on the periphery of your vision, age three, four, five, wouldn't you grow up thinking, oh, maybe all these policemen are going around shooting people who look like me? Right? We're importing needlessly a problem that is nothing to do with us at all. And I, I think that the same has happened in all of the other Anglosphere democracies. It, it, there's, we've taken a, a, a US quarrel and we've mapped it, however implausibly, onto the different contours of our own national conditions. So in Canada, it's taken the form of this row over the imagined genocide, uh, which has become a culture war beyond any fact or reason. Uh, in Australia, obviously, it took the form of the recent referendum. Here, obviously, it's been about the treaty, as you guys know better than I do. But I think we should be careful not to make problems where they don't exist, not to create difficulties where we don't have them. And I think there's been a, an issue here where both, frankly, both judges and politicians have been creating problems by going beyond the text of a successful treaty and uh, adding, or let's say, ruling on the basis of what they think it ought to have said rather than what it actually says. Let me make... 
<laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, let me say one other thing, if I may, just, and I'll, I'll finish on this, about, about the danger of tribalism, which is ultimately what all this is about, right? Because we're, we're moving away from the idea of equal citizenship before the law. We are introducing, or reintroducing, I should say, the idea of uh, being defined by birth or caste or ancestry or physiognomy. My problem with that is not that it's kind of ridiculous and absurd and, you know, political correctness gone mad and harumph harumph. I think that misses the, the danger. The real danger is that it's horribly plausible. Because until an eye blink ago, it is how all human societies operated. We're a tribal species. We evolved in kin groups. The oldest ethic for a hunter-gatherer species like ours is my clan good, your clan bad. Vendetta and blood feud were the norm in almost every society. Hunter-gatherer, then agrarian, until what? A couple of hundred years ago. 400 at the, at the most. And so the danger of this identity <coughs> politics is that it takes us back to these pre-enlightenment times. It's, it's, it's uh, only skin deep that we have this civilization. It's only because we've been habituated, taught, educated. Right? Think of what's happening. Think of how our societies are being now divided over the quarrels in Israel and Gaza. Think how tribally that's happening. I suspect this is true in New Zealand, certainly true in the UK. If you tell me where somebody stands on climate change, BLM, trans rights, <laughs> I can tell you with probably an 80% accuracy rate where, whether they will back Israel or Palestine, right? It's kind of weird if you think about it, right? Right, right, because we have tribalized it. Because we have tribalized it. Because tribe here in a modern society like ours is no longer defined by consanguinity or religion. It's defined by who is in the perceived victim group. Are you an oppressor, are you, right? So, so, if, so if you are pro-BLM or you're pro-trans, you just look for who are the designated victims here uh, and you don't look any, any closer. I think this is actually incredibly dangerous. We've divided over foreign policy before. We divided over foreign policy a generation ago uh, uh, with Iraq and a generation before that with Vietnam. Uh, a generation before that with Spain, you could say, right? But never with this vitriol, never with this sense that your opponents are kind of personally threatening to you. This is new and highly dangerous because it's based on tribal affinity rather than on engagement with the issue. I'll give you an example from the Holy Land. Just as the, the, the Old Testament is incredibly full of genocide. You know, to, to a degree that you wouldn't, it's quite shocking when you read bits of it, right? And, but actually it's not shocking because if you think about all human societies were organized that way until an eye blink ago, right? So whether it was written in, I don't know, 14th century BC Canaan or in 6th century BC Babylon or whatever it was, they would reflect the, the values that everybody had at that time. One, one story that just really leapt out at me is, is a shocking one. We all tend to forget it. It's in the book of Samuel. There's a, there's a famine, and David is the king at the time. So David says, what do I do to stop the famine? You remember that David had a sort of hotline to the Almighty. They talked all the time. And, and God says, ah, this is because you carry the blood guilt, is the word they use in the authorized version. You carry the blood guilt for the crime of your predecessor, Saul, who broke a treaty to attack these people called the Gibeonites. Right? So David goes to the Gibeonites and says, what do I need to do to make this good? And the Gibeonites say, oh, just give us seven of, Paul, uh, of Saul's grandchildren and we will torture them to death. And so David hands them over and they are duly executed and the famine ends, right? Now, I hope what you are all shocked by in that story is what I'm shocked by, which is like, what have the grandchildren done wrong, yeah? But my point is, my friends, we are highly unusual in thinking like that. We are products of an extraordinary education system that has taught us to transcend our tribal feelings and to recognize this feeling, that this, this uh, uh, precept that doesn't come naturally, which is that every human being is individually accountable, that, that, that we are answerable for good or ill, for our own actions and behavior, and that we don't get a special pass because of who our grandfather was or because we're, we're in a particular caste or tribe. Right? That is what is at stake here. It's, at what's, it's what's at stake in every other English-speaking democracy. And we have to cling to something that is highly fragile and contingent, because if we slide back into that pre-enlightenment tribal way of thinking, we know it will end extremely badly. 
Uh, when I see those, uh, those mobs on our war memorials in the UK, I think, well, actually, the, the, the amazing thing is that we had hundreds of years where people didn't do this because we felt we had in common enough, one with another, regardless of where we were from. And you lose that, it's all over. And I just have to come back to saying this is all about teaching people. It doesn't come naturally. It's the easiest thing in the world is to think of yourself in sectional or caste terms. The, uh, the great German-American philosopher Hannah Arendt, the chronicler of the Eichmann trial, had a nice phrase once. She said, every generation, Western civilization, is invaded by barbarians. We call them children, right? In other words, you all came into the world with the same <laughs> basic apparatus, the, the same emotional and, and intellectual apparatus that we would have done 10,000 years ago. Why don't we live the way we did 10,000 years ago? Because we have taught people through a process of agglomerative acculturation to value the individual, to overcome those impulses, and to, to, uh, to understand that if somebody has wronged you, it's not OK to take it out on a relative or someone who looks like them. Now, you all know how I'm going to finish this, right? Our schools and universities are not doing that anymore. They're doing the opposite in many cases. They're teaching that the single most important thing about you is that you're female or white or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you can't maintain an open society on that basis. The great Thomas Sowell said, you can't run a liberal democracy if two babies born on the same day are held to have come into this world with a set of pre-existing grievances against each other. So this is why we need to treasure the principles that since Magna Carta have elevated and ennobled our civilization, have taught us the dignity and value of the individual. And that is your charge, especially you ministers in this new government and you think tankers who support them, right? It's up to you to maintain that extraordinary and sublime heritage that has not only made this such a blessed country, but has led it to enrich the world and has given so much to the happiness of mankind. It's up to you to keep intact that extraordinary heritage. To remember that New Zealanders are not a random set of individuals born to a different random set of individuals, but that wherever their grandparents were from, they are now also co-inheritors of that patrimony. And that inheriting it carries a commensurate responsibility to keep that inheritance intact and to pass it on securely to the next generation.